engagement. Welcome to our side event organized by the uh, United Nations Office uh, for the High Representative for the landlocked, uh, for the least developed countries, landlocked developing countries, and the small island de developing states. Uh, as um, some of you may know, that the uh, 30 UN conference on landlocked developing countries will be held in Kigali, uh, Rwanda later this year. And this once in a decade event uh, will bring together what leaders, government officials, uh, senior man management from the United, Na United Nations and other international organizations uh, and regional organizations, and also entities from the civil society, pro private sector, uh, and as well as uh, the youth representatives. Um, they will um, come together to consult on the blueprint for the LRDCs in the following decade and adopt a new program of action as an outcome document. Uh, so uh, the new uh, program of action uh, has been building up on the reflections of the Vienna program, program of action for the landlocked developing countries and also an uh, overview of uh, the difficulties and challenges faced by the LRDCs in the context of um, uh, intertwined global uh, uncertainties in different spheres, and also concerns and the most urgent needs of LRDCs, especially uh, their call for support from the uh, international community. Uh, in LRDCs, some 58% of the population are under 25 years old. Uh, so uh, there can be no sustainable development without the involvement of the youth who will be the inheritors and uh, drivers of the decisions made in Kigali. Uh, that is why we always deem it vital to make the youth fully engaged in the decision making process. The voice and demands of the youth should be heard in this regard. So uh, this side events side event is not only a, a constituent of the ECOSOC Youth Forum, but, but also a rehearsal featuring the, uh, the, the, the debut of the selected uh, youth uh, entrepreneurs for LRDC, LRDC3. Uh, so uh, today we are quite glad to have a diversified scope of participants, including youth entrepreneurs, UN representatives and policymakers, uh, so the one hour side event will be centered around the experience sharing of youth entrepreneurs and uh, interactive discussions with the representatives from civil society and from the United Nations. Uh, and the purpose is uh, to explore how to bring the youth to the forefront of the efforts of achieving the 2030 agenda and beyond. Uh, so I now pass the floor to my colleague Jamie, who will be speaking from his role as the lead of private sector forum of the uh, uh, DC3. Uh, Jamie, over to you. Thank you very much, and, and thank you for the, um, the kind of the broad backgrounds to um, uh, why we're here today and, and what we're leading up to. So, um, yeah, for us, this is we consider this a preparatory event in the in the road to this uh, third United Nations conference for landlocked developing countries. And the um, United Nations General Assembly decided that that conference would be a, a, a full stakeholder, whole of society conference involving the range of um, stakeholders that uh, Shin just mentioned, you know, the youth, civil society organizations, parliamentarians, and of course the private sector, because at the end of the day, uh, development occurs not because someone writes a, a beautifully written paper in some UN building or government office, but because the private sector leads that development, creates jobs and creates economic growth. So we're delighted that in the uh, Third United Nations Conference for um, Landlocked Development Countries, or LLDC3 as we call it, uh, there's going to be a private sector forum featuring uh, some of the leading CEOs from um, uh, uh, landlocked developing countries, but also uh, global business leaders. And uh, as well, the reason why we're here today to feature some of the voices of youth entrepreneurs as uh, leading and inspiring uh, individuals who are, who are creating businesses and uh, uh, leading the next uh, round of change in LLDCs. So in a way, this uh, meeting today is a chance to to hear what those voices are like and think about how they can fit into that um, that uh, high level uh, private sector forum. Um, I think it's an excellent uh, opportunity to be able to hear from you all. And um, with that, let me pass over to my colleague Yuki, who will uh, be moderating the panel discussion today. 
Thank you very much. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you, Shin, for the wonderful introduction. Very, very excited to now introduce our youth entrepreneurs from different landlocked developing countries. We really have a great variety of backgrounds and from different countries uh, joining us to share their experiences. I wish um, now to introduce uh, our entrepreneur from Burundi, Bokim Beni, who is now joining us. Um, Bokim, I would like to pass the floor to you to tell us about your experience as an entrepreneur in your country, but also tell us also how did it come? What is your experience to be a youth entrepreneur in a landlocked developing country? What are your insights and highlights? Over to you, Bokim. Really excited to hear from your experience. Bokim, the floor is yours. I can see you on the good screen. Afternoon. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, very good. Thank you. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Can you hear me again? <laughs> yes, so Bokim, we can is, hear you. Uh, my, my name is Bokim Benini Jose. I'm, uh, I'm an entrepreneur from Burundi. Hello? Yes, Bakim, we can hear you very well. Bokim, I think you're muted now. Um, if you could unmute yourself. Okay, now it's okay. Yes, very good. Thank you. Okay, great. My name is Bokim Benini Jose. Um, I'm an entrepreneur from Burundi and I'm founder and CEO of Trade Legacy. Um, yeah. I started my company in 2020. Can you hear me again? Yes, please continue. We can hear you. It seems that Bokin's uh, camera or screen is frozen. Uh, I hope uh, we can get him back once his uh, connection is better. In the meantime, I would like to pass the floor to Tadala, who I can see very well. Tadala, if you could uh, tell us about um, your experience. I know you are a youth entrepreneur from Malawi, a different country, landlocked developing country. I'm very excited about your very innovative business. Um, can you tell us about your experience, how are you are doing, how it came to the journey to become an entrepreneur and what are you, what your business is doing and what your experience is in, in Malawi. Over to you, Tadala. All right, uh, thank you. I'm hoping everyone can hear me loud and clear. Yes, yes. thank okay. you. So I'm Tadala Maguluni. I'm from Malawi, which is a landlocked country. It's very small if you can look at it on the map. Uh, but I'm also the CEO and co-founder for Nyasa Area Data Solutions. Um, my entrepreneurial journey began after my friends and I graduated from the African Drill and Data Academy in 2020. So basically, we were learning how to build drones, how to fly drones, and how we can incorporate those in different aspects in life. So 
we shared um, a passion for leveraging technology, artificial intelligence, geographical information systems to address placing cli uh, climate change and as well as environmental issues in Malawi. Um, if you can look back to the past years, you agree with me how cyclones and floods have uh, were, were affected by those in the in the past years. So we're looking at that and also sharing the same experience with my friend. We decided that we can come together and uh, start a company called Nyasa Area Data Solutions to co to combine all our expertise um, to fight against climate change as well as environmental issues that are that are there. Um, what inspired us the most was uh, the need for innovative solutions, especially being a landlocked country. So we were looking at uh, how innovative can we get, especially as youth in, in, in such environments to combat the effects of uh, uh, environmental degradation as well as climate change, um, uh, as well as bearing in mind that we are the ones that uh, receive the extreme uh, effects of these um, of these issues of climate change. So uh, seeing, seeing this impact as well as uh, having this expertise, we started this uh, company called Nyasario Data Solutions to use drones. So what we do is we collect, uh, we collect um, images, imageries in different scenarios, including when, when there is floods, before and after floods, issues to do with environmental degradation and anything in between. And then we do data analysis uh, for a greater cost to contribute to a sustainable development, as well as environmental conservation. Uh, we, are, we have been able to work with big organizations, including World Bank in a project called Alika. We have also worked with institutions and research institutions, including universities and colleges. And we're also able to train different government and non-governmental institutions on how they can also use drones and GIS in different activities. Basically, that's what I can say. Thank you. Thank you, Tadala. This is very inspiring to hear from your ideas and uh, starting to work with drones for climate change impact disaster risk area. Very relevant also for the SDGs at the United Nations. So very exciting to hear about this experience from you from Malawi. I wish to pass the floor now to uh, our youth entrepreneur from Rwanda. Joseph, Joseph, please tell us about your experience in your country. I know your business is operating in multiple different countries in Africa. Very excited to hear from your background and your business. Over to you, Joseph. Thank you, thank you. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here today and share uh, my entrepreneurial journey uh, with Greenleaf GRA. We are based in Rwanda currently, but we are operating in some other countries, like before in East African countries. And uh, as the elderly DC's countries, um, uh, we are trying to join our business through elderly DC countries to those countries that have ports and seats so where we can be shipping our product. So my entrepreneurial journey is uh, was fueled by my passion of addressing community problem, particularly in the, the countries like ours, where food security and uh, malnutrition, job creation is an issue. But uh, I decided to start a green leaf back in 2018. And uh, Greenleaf is a, we are trying to revolutionize agriculture sector and uh, through urban farming and the controlled environment agriculture so that we can cross the gap between uh, what we are producing and not being consumed, crossing the loop with technology, the, addressing the post harvest, the climate change issues. So you see that uh, farming, in, especially in these countries, a uh, few of you who have been to Rwanda, all, all of you, uh, it's uh, part of Rwanda is uh, semi-arid. So embedding technology in addressing the climate change issues have been something that driving our businesses in order to help the community to achieve. So coming from the landlocked countries, it was also an obstacle and uh, you know, uh, also access to finance, have been also limiting every although we have achieved some we have some achievement but also the challenge have been outstanding 
so trying to connect uh, activities through different countries also is facilitating our activities to address uh, food security issues and the malnutrition, as well as uh, creating job for people. But also the platform we are being given by the government and the, the developmental partners is also a groundbreaking approach to tap into the other markets via these platforms. And uh, also, uh, what young entrepreneurs want, it's uh, a company, someone who can be with them and go with them through that journey of uh, starting up a business and uh, maybe through ideation up to the scaling. So development partners, incubation centers, we need them. Also funding partners, we need them to understand the youth and uh, also uh, young entrepreneurs. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph, for sharing your passion and experience from your country. It's very exciting to hear also the bridges between Tadala's experience in climate change, your area in agriculture, but also using the new technologies like drones, in your case, platforms to connect. So this is a very exciting bridge we are hearing here. I wish to now pass the floor to Birgun from Mongolia, who is also working with uh, the, the internet and websites connecting youth and uh, other partners. So over to you, Birgun. Very excited to hear from you. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, everyone can hear me, right? Yes, very well. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, my name is uh, Birgun. And I am the co-founder of Nomaducate LLC. And I'm very pleased to be here with you all. Um, I'm joining this forum from Mongolia. And Mongolia is a landlocked country located in uh, East Asia and lies right in between China and Russia. Um, as you may already know, the main driving industry for the Mongolian economy is the mining sector. And this sector is the biggest um, employers in like the job offers in Mongolia. And that sector comes with its own challenges when it comes to a landlocked country in Mongolia, like Mongolia. And uh, however, uh, as I have observed over the last couple of years, I believe that in Mongolia that a lot of companies of all sizes are becoming more focused on developing business models that are digital solution based. Um, and we have many successful small, mid and even large size companies in Mongolia that are offering these types of solutions. Um, for example, we have UBCAB, which is like the Mongolian uh, app for Uber and TokTok Delivery, which is like the Mongolian app for DoorDash and Talkia app for paying like your parking fees. So there's like all these like different apps being developed in Mongolia that are sol solving um, everyday problems for people. And on top of this, there are lots of like um, fintech solution apps and payment apps as well, like local ones. And one thing that these businesses have in common is that they are efficiently solving people's everyday problems and creating a certain value for them in return for a service fee, right? So when your business is more digital or online based, you don't really feel much of the challenges that Lock, landlocked countries face when doing um, business in in, the, in in different industries such as like trade or agriculture, right? So our business model is pretty similar to what I have just described. Um, so it's to create a platform where graduates or current students of the top universities in the world, they can be they're going to be able to connect with aspiring students who are, the students who are trying to get into that school that they're already admitted into, and then they can offer um, advice and mentorship on how to get admitted to the schools and generally provide uh, like freelance services related to the admission to the, uh, to the school that they are studying in. Um, so we came up with this idea when, well, because in Mongolia, in order to be admitted to a good university abroad, uh, high school students usually go through education agencies who charge them service fees for getting them into admitted into certain schools. And we thought that through our uh, uh, website, the benefit for the mentor will be that the 
mentoring somebody, they'll be receiving a consultancy fee. And the benefit for the high school student is that they'll be able to greatly enhance their chances of getting admitted to the school of their choice. So it's basically providing a platform where uh, current students or graduate uh, graduated students can uh, be connected with aspiring high school students or people who are looking for mentorship or advice on how to get into the schools. And they can even provide further like uh, freelance services, like reviewing their essays, reviewing their applications, um, study plans, and et cetera. And um, <clears throat> yeah, so basically our website will be just like a platform that connects two different people for a mutual benefit, beneficial uh, partnership. Um, so right, uh, I cannot say that our business is like uh, one of the successful cases in Mongolia right now because it's still in the development phase and we are looking forward to launching our website uh, within this year. The, uh, yeah, that's our goal right now. So, um, so basically, yeah, to go back to what I was saying about uh, the trending biz uh, business models in Mongolia is that a lot of businesses in Mongolia are becoming more digital and IT based. Uh, companies and they are solving people's problems, uh, everyday problems through smart solutions and through the power of information technology. And that's what we are trying to do with uh, Nomadic Gate. Um, yeah. Thank you, Birgun. This is very exciting to hear how you're using digital solutions, platforms, and then the upcoming trend in your country that these digital solutions are really everyday life solutions for for your your country and then using that to connect uh, education and also the main industries the platform you're building up to really nice visions i really hope um, the best and great success for your company even though you're saying you're just launching and you don't know how this is going. I see great vision for that. Um, so really hoping this is going towards uh, an exciting direction for, for the youth uh, entrepreneurs we are also having here together. I'm hoping that uh, I can again try to pass the floor to Bokim from Burundi. I don't know if his internet has recovered. I know one of the challenges, um, of course, is um, connectivity. This is also some of the things we are discussing. So we are experiencing this uh, very life. Um, but let's let's try again. Bukim, can you can you hear us? Are you are you able to share your experience with us? Yes. Good afternoon. Can you hear me now? Yes. This is very good. Thank you, Bukim. Please please share your experience with us. Okay, thank you. Uh, first of all, I apologize again for the for the internet issues. By the way, one of the challenges we are having in my country is uh, access to internet, especially for people who who are in who works and uh, I mean who are in countryside. I mean rural areas. This is one of the challenges that we have, and uh, I think that you can even testify that. Okay, so now um, again, my name is Bokim Benini Jose. I'm founder and CEO of um, Trade Legacy Burundi. Yeah, Trade Legacy Burundi is an enterprise that focuses more into um, cross-border business, especially when it comes to exporting um, agricultural product, mostly produced by um, young entrepreneurs in rural areas. So I, uh, my main motivation to start my company was that um, I was staying uh, countryside in rural areas in a city called Kitega. It's at 100 kilometers away from the capital city, Bujumbura. Uh, where I was seeing three major challenges in my in my neighborhood. The main the, the main challenge was food security. The second challenge was um, uh, the, the, the agriculture. People were farming just to uh, consume only, not for commercial purpose. And uh, the third challenge was access to uh, logistic services. People were farming, but they couldn't export. And nowadays, as we speak now in my country, we are facing a very serious problem when it comes to foreign currencies. And one of the best solution that we that can solve that challenge is to export. So now, I came with a solution. I started farming at an early age, by the way. I started farming, it was in 2017, when I was finishing my high school. Uh, and again, I started to raise awareness 
on um, the benefit on, of exporting agriculture-based product because um, it, it was proven that uh, uh, our agricultural product are still G, uh, are non GMO they are bio so it's still, we are still using natural uh, agricultural products so uh, we are uh, I was saying that um, our our agricultural products are non GMO they are still natural so uh, this this is one of the benefit uh, that we have uh, or, or um, advantages that we have in in my region so I started raising awareness on how we can export and now uh, in my uh, within my um, cycle of uh, business in rural, uh, in rural areas I have almost uh, 55 young people and 25 women that I work with and they export we export on a daily basis on a weekly basis sorry so it, to our neighboring countries like Rwanda Tanzania Kenya and Uganda thank you Thank you, Bokim. Very exciting to hear from your experience. I'm already hearing a lot of commonalities among uh, youth entrepreneurs in landlocked developing countries, very specific issues you have raised, uh, including digital solutions, climate change issues, agricultural sphere, but also the connectivity and transport issues, which is very unique to landlocked developing countries. We still have one more uh, entrepreneur left from Botswana. Uh, Mokitsi, if you could uh, quickly um, say something or tell us if you are with us and hear, be able to hear us. Mokitsi is a youth entrepreneur from Botswana working in the fintech area. Mokitsi, if we can pass the floor to you, it would be very nice to hear from your experience in Botswana. Yeah, thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. Um, yes, thank you, Mokitsi. Okay, great stuff. So, so basically, we we work with software um, startups, uh, mainly new economy companies, and uh, through our company called Pulaspace.com. So, well, Pulaspace was actually created by accident uh, during COVID because everybody was stuck at home and people were building companies and they couldn't leave their houses to go look for the money. So, we were able to raise about twenty thousand dollars from one of the our angel, you know, investors, somebody who was a mentor of mine, so give us about $20,000 $20, during COVID. And with that $20,000, we have been able to build a pl platform that mainly connects, you know, um, internet startups with, um, with, with early stage investors. Because as you will know, um, if you look at the funding gap, right, in the geographies like your Botswana, your Lesotho, your Swaziland, your Rwanda's, it's generally that there is limitations in terms of access to venture capital, but you find a lot of young people are innovating every day, but they're not writing the, they're not getting funded as fast as possible. But it doesn't mean that in these countries there aren't individuals with their own private money who might be willing to be part of that investment. If you look at Silicon Valley, it's inspired by venture capital, you know. So similarly, what we have done with Bula Space is we've been able to build a platform that's been able to attract over 489 plus startups and these startups generally we did not go out to look for them it was an organic process in which after we launched the platform just companies started coming into the platform and they were raising capital anything from ten thousand dollars all the way to two hundred fifty thousand dollars so we've been able to aggregate all this deal flow into our platform and we've been able to also validate the other side of the platform which is the, the investor side so we currently have over 92 plus uh, angel investors who are syndicates who are willing to invest their own private money or with a minimum check of ten thousand dollars to hundred thousand dollars into these companies so by geography we operate out of Botswana we are stationed in Botswana and then because normally when you say Botswana people just know South Africa right uh, so we've now had to create um, a subsidiary of our company in South Africa because we had to explain a lot where Botswana is you know it, Botswana is just known for diamonds and and, and, and elephants, right? <laughs> so we had to make sure we've got a management company sitting in South Africa. So that was, we talked to limited partners from around the world. When we say South Africa quickly, oh, the money's coming to South Africa, then going to Botswana. Okay, then it makes sense. Then recently, you know, post launch, we realized Rwanda was now ambitious about becoming a financial hub 
So we have been having conversations about setting up a $10 million fund in Rwanda with the Kigali International Financial Center, where we are hoping that we will be able to place the $10 million fund, which will pull us base capital, which will set out of Rwanda and now be able to fund the pipeline that we get. I mean, on a daily basis, because I'm a full-time entrepreneur, um, we organically get about three to four new companies every day over LinkedIn. We don't advertise, we just show the impact of our work. If you go on my LinkedIn, if you realize I work with a very lean team. All our team members, we don't own offices, we don't own any physical assets. Everything of ours is done using the internet. We have we have raised over you know hundred thousand dollars in Botswana from corporates for the work that we do. Mainly this work would be around supporting initiatives that make sure that a young person can innovate. Let me give you an example. We were able to get money from one of the banks and some of the telecommunication companies in Botswana. We went to a remote village with young people. We taught, we taught them coding. One of the young people who was, uh, you know, 12 year old, decided he actually invented like the first game of the Makadi Kadi pen. If you know, it's a big pen in Botswana. They were able to digitize that, that, that thing through code. And then we we're able to now take that idea into a digital product. And now we're looking for investors that can now put in about $10,000 or five. So that young person now owns the digital asset. So what we promote in our work is young people are at the forefront of my leadership. You know, I, I command a very small team of eight, you know, uh, people that work with me in Botswana. Then I have a partner who sits in, 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 in Nigeria who also commands two developers. Our platform was developed, you know, out of Nigeria. But while we, we were inspiring the, the innovation out of Botswana, the idea and the challenge out of Botswana, we also have been able to get an investor out of Singapore who came in as a partner and is being able to support the company by paying salaries for the developers, supporting the vision that I have. And recently, we've been getting a lot of traction, like I'm saying, from both the uh, corporates in Botswana, where I've now been appointed as a board member of the National Innovation, because I've seen that we're actually saying it's beyond the infrastructure, it's more about the networks and the talent, right? So we are happy to hear, to share, and to show the young people that, you know, all you need nowadays is just a laptop uh, and internet, and then you just build your product, you launch it, and you can be, and we're a true example of that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Moketsi. This is very, very exciting to hear from you. I feel there is a accelerator facilitator for youth entrepreneurs in general. I also hear that this is a solution you're providing for a lot of different youth entrepreneurs. And I feel the inspiration here shared with, uh, with everyone here in, in different landlocked developing countries. I think this is something you can very relate to as well. Uh, I think financing issues was also mentioned by Joseph, using platforms, new digital solutions. Um, I think it was very, very much uh, something cross-cutting with Bill Goon's business as well. The the perspective on digital and and using innovative solution. I, I hear these things from, from Tadala, from Bukim, and uh, all the youth entrepreneurs uh, joining us here. And I think um, all these all these uh, overarching solutions you're bringing up, but also the hurdles you have to overcome as a landlocked developing country, a youth entrepreneur. I'm very um, glad to to hear these these experiences from the ground because, as uh, Jamie and Shin at the beginning has mentioned, it is a very rare thing for us to have just just to work on the international sphere. But really, what we are doing is to really connect the the perspectives and and see the the impacts on the ground. And and you guys are really sharing the front experiences you are having as youth entrepreneurs. So really wish to thank. Uh, Tadala, Joseph, Bilgun, Bokim, Mokitsi for, for sharing your experiences from your respective countries. I think we have also a very big variety of, of backgrounds of, of you people um, from, from the different land of developing countries, but also a lot of commonalities. And I wish to discuss this um, also, including our discussants, who I wish to now introduce. We have Benson and Minji from the LLDC Youth Advisory Group, who are pen holders of the Youth Declaration. I'm sure um, you two having great experience uh, in the area of uh, youth in general. Obviously, I guess you have been in touch with some youth entrepreneurs, but more from the bigger picture of being leads of uh, youth uh, agencies, NGOs you're working with, but also being the drafters and pen holders of the youth declaration. I think this, this conversation we are having here is giving us a lot of great inputs uh, in, in our ideas we would like to shape for the LLDC3. 
We also have Jamie, who is uh, going to comment from the private sector perspective. Uh, very exciting to hear uh, from you as well, given you are also bridging the LLDC3, you and uh, the uh, private sector forum from your side and bridging this with the youth forum. And we also have Ellen. Uh, from ITU on board. Ellen, I think uh, we've heard a lot of uh, different areas in digital ICT innovation, which is really your expertise area. So hearing from you uh, would be also a great uh, benefit from us to cross cut the LLDC issues. So first I wish to pass the floor to Benson uh, with your insights and um, also Minji to interact on the youth entrepreneur side. Over to you, thank you. Thank you, Yuki. Um, I must say, you know, this has been a very, very interesting and amazing work that you guys are doing. Um, I mean, it's 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 a lot of work you are doing on the ground and you are breaking new ground with especially technology. I like the way that everyone is engaging with technology and using that uh, technology to be able to to come up with their innovations. And, you know, it's 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 one of those things for me that what moves me much is, you know, these guys are within the communities and finding solutions from within their communities to be able to respond to their challenges. And what interests me as well, Joseph mentioned that, that there's a lot of support uh, from the Rwandan government, which is something very, very important. And as we run towards the, the Rwanda conference, uh, this declaration that we're preparing is something that's going to speak to the government, something that's going to speak to the people that matter. I know there was also a comment that, you know, there's need for these uh, institutions and these uh, platforms to be able to support young people. I would want to just understand and also get to know from uh, from these young entrepreneurs how they think uh, the government and also international organizations can possibly better support them and be able to make their innovations possibly scale up or, or even to take up like uh, what ha what's about to happen in Mongolia. What do you guys think about that? Maybe I'll just pause anyone who wants to share on this. How do you think the government and also the international organizations will be able to, to support you? This is very important for us because as we are drafting the declaration, these are some of the things that we'd want to also be able to include in that. Thank you. Anyone who wants to take that? I see Mokitsi actually, please. Yeah, thank you very much. I think, look, um, government just has to set the policy right for young people to be able to innovate. You know, I think we have seen, you know, countries like Rwanda, like Kenya, even Nigeria that are creating, you know, policies like Startup Acts. You know, Startup Acts are now like a new instrument that allow, you know, young internet companies to be created and then to be incentive around doing that. I think this is what other developing countries like Botswana could follow the example of, right, to see why Rwanda is doing well. But also, it's also about leadership. I think you need to get governments to champion innovation, especially technology. I think the Rwandan government has got a very strong leader who believes the whole system in Rwanda is, is technology based. So this shows that the policymakers are thinking intentionally about putting for IR, even artificial intelligence at the forefront of what they're doing. And I think for the young people in terms of co-creating. Government must allow the process to be co-created with the young people, the youth. It's not a process where government goes sits in parliament and creates things. They must look at what type of companies are being created, where, by who, in which geography. And it's nice that everybody tries to mimic Silicon Valley, you know, Southeast Asia, but I think Africa has to define its own innovation. Um, you know, in Botswana, for example, I, I think the policymakers could look at incentives around indigenous, indigenous knowledge, right? Uh, each country in Africa has its own unique sense of what innovation is. We've got to package that together as policy because we can all be trying to work on artificial intelligence. But the people in the communities need food. So sometimes, you know, innovation is not like creating AI. It's about making sure you solve people's problems. So this is what I think we need to take as the message to the government. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mokitsi. I think I also saw Tadala's hand very briefly. Yes, you did. So basically, um, I was about to say what Mokiti has said uh, about investing and having policies that align specifically uh, to the youth. 
So the policy makers and to the global leaders, I think the emphasis should be on the importance of supporting the youth-led initiatives um, in our countries, especially the countries also like Malawi. I think we're facing the same thing uh, as Botswana is facing, that uh, 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 we are not putting the youth um, on a broader spectrum as other businesses are, because maybe we're still stuck with the same beliefs and the old beliefs that were there in the past. But now we should all agree, and we're all agreeing that the youth are representing the future of the of the nations. And empowering our uh, entrepreneurship is so it's not just a choice, but it's something that um, countries as well as policymakers uh, and government should invest in of, for sustain, sustainability as well as um, as well as the development. We're also talking about issues. Um, I, I think all of us talked about is to do with um, uh, investment. So for um, uh, for investors outside and uh, 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 international people, we're looking at uh, having investments as well as requirements for for funding that are tailor made for countries like ours, so that it's easy for youth-led organisations and ventures to tap in. So having them tailor made specifically for countries that are landlocked. It's going to be easier to scale up uh, our innovations, our ideas, and everything. Thank you. Thank you, Tadala. Very in insightful views you're sharing with us. I would like to pass back the floor to our discussants, Benson, Minji, if you have any further reactions. Yeah, can I just say something? Can I just add something maybe before they yes, come in? Sure. I forgot. Yeah, yes. I'm going to say for, for the DFIs, the development partners like the UN and all this. I think it's important that you also directly take the capital to the entrepreneurs. I know sometimes you take you know, capital directly to government. It becomes a bureaucratic, two bureaucratic processes to see the impact. So in most communities, you find out that innovation hubs. Like, you know, our pipeline is based on real reality of owning two innovation hubs. So if you could fund, you know, these entrepreneur support organizations directly, you will quickly see the result because government will then now see the jobs being reported. You will also see the impact being done. So it's important that also, you know, the DFIs, the donors, be intentional about making sure the money not only goes to government organizations, it also goes to the actual innovators and the impact creators, if not the facilitators, therefore of that. I'm giving this example because I'm part of a team in Botswana that manage, manage a hundred million Ula fund, okay? <laughs> Our biggest challenge there is that we have the money. But our systems are so bureaucratic that we fail to dispense of the money very fast to the innovators. So if you bring in your idea, we're probably going to fund you after 18 months. Who has time to wait for 18 months with an idea? So young people are creating, but then it's, it's taking a long process to get make sure the resources that they need for them to create impact is given to them. So let's consider a new, a new financing instrument around funding a young technology company or a young entrepreneur in Africa, which is without making the process, even if you can think about 0% interest-free loans, right, for things that are kind of very impactful and doing mesh funding through government. So, you know, and I think this is this is the new level of, uh, uh, of thinking that is there in terms of bringing new smart capital, not just bringing money, but also bringing mentorship, you know, bringing networks, bringing access to markets. I think these are the real core challenges that, an ordinary entrepreneur like me needs, right? I mean, we, we met a young guy last week who came to our innovation hub, which is a $1 billion building. And she said, I don't need money from you guys. I need you guys to connect me with legal expertise because I'm signing contracts in other markets. I go to Zimbabwe, I go to DRC. Can you be able to, to give me that value? We didn't have that package for him, but we've got money. So I think this is what we need to look at. What are the real needs of the entrepreneur in every geography in Africa? And we will be able to answer that the, the real pain point of the entrepreneur. Because if the entrepreneur succeeds, the government succeeds. The DFI also succeeds. Thank you. Thank you, Makiti. Back to the discussions. Very insightful. Thank you very much. Yeah, a very, very, very good feedback. Uh, I will stop here, but I think it's it's uh, what's coming out so clear is we need policy and we also need the investment flowing to, to the young people. Thank you, guys. Uh, I'll, I'll give it over to Winji. Uh, to, to also um, come in. Okay, thank you, Yuki and Benson. And it's just been amazing to hear the great work that, you know, every young entrepreneur is doing in 
various LLDCs. And um, I think what's really come out and what's common among all the entrepreneurs is that everybody really is getting to leverage on, you know, technology. And um, I think everybody that has presented today really has spoken to how they're leveraging um, technology and innovation, which is great to hear for um, landlocked developing countries. And I believe we're obviously on the, on the right path. And I did hear um, Bokim, obviously, and Joseph did speak to, to partnerships. And so um, the question that I have for, for you um, is how do you feel, and this can, can be answered by any of the um, young entrepreneurs that we have, how do you feel that you know, partnerships between young people like yourselves and um, global networks can be in, um, used to enhance, obviously, the implementation of the sustainable development goals? So anybody can can feel free to answer that. I know um, specifically for Bokim and Joseph. Oh, Tadala, yes, Tadala. Um, I think it's very the partnerships are really important. One for exposure. So it goes back to what uh, what uh, other people, uh, countries, and other youth are doing, uh, uh, county wide, national wide. What are they doing and how can we somehow in, incorporate it? At the same time, it goes back to um, having, uh, getting information as well as talent and hands-on experience and trainings in between. So the partnerships are not just there for the money also. They're also there for the talents that we can gain from each other. They're also there for direction. Uh, how best can we run this? Because if you are partnering with, for example, I'm a startup company. We, we've been here for like three years. But if I'm partnering with a company that has been there for 10 years or 15 years or 40 years, they'll be able to direct me that this is how things are be, can be run. This is how you can uh, get resources. You can get funding. You can get mentorship. And this is how we can mentor you in a wrong land. And I feel like they're, they're very important on, in one way or the other for the young entrepreneurs. It's like having... a uh, a big brother or big sister that you can look up to al along the way. So I feel like they, they, they're very core cool, uh, as inter uh, entrepreneurs in the long run. Thank you, Tadala. I also see Bill Goon. Yeah, um, yeah, I agree that um, the partnerships with uh, these ventures are very important and for um, case for like a case like ours uh, the Magicate, the goal for our digital business is to take our um, business model and try to prove the concept domestically and then take our business overseas so that's I think that's like the, like the common goal for every um, uh, young entrepreneurs to take their businesses to international markets to upscale. So I think that uh, these partnerships will be very important to achieve that. Thank you, Bergun. I also see Joseph on this. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, I guess we, when we think about a partnership, we also need to, to see where does these partners find entrepreneurs. So we need the spaces with a, like a, an infrastructure. For instance, in Rwanda, the, we have a Noshkin house. At the Noshkin house, they host around 5,000 entrepreneurs. So if they are able to put their, we have an internet and some other infrastructures, but we don't have a specific lab for this specific business. Even though we have a health tech hub and a circular economy and others, but we don't have specific laboratories for that. So I think also that can add values to the partnership they are trying to make. Even those who, are, who need the legal advices and uh, some other technical work, they can have uh, that space to tap into. Like those who are dealing in the drone, if they have like a, a lab that can help them, maybe at least in assembling those drones, training them, guiding them through the policies, helping them to discuss with the government about the policies. I think that can add value to what they are doing. Thank you. 
Thank you, Yosef. Uh, very, very much also connecting to Tadala's business. I see Tadala reacting as well. Um, Bukim, I also see your hand. Yeah, thank you for, for, for giving the floor. I hope that you can hear me. Yes. So now, um, when we talk about, uh, I would like to emphasize on, uh, when we talk about partnerships, um, at some point, I understand the exposure. For example, I mean, logistics and transport and agriculture and distribution. Now, in Africa, we have what we call AFCFTA. I hope that everyone is aware of AFCFTA, African Continental Free Trade Area. So now, the question is, someone from Burundi, like me, an entrepreneur from rural, account, uh, from rural areas, how will I sell my, uh, how will I say my uh, goods or product to um, any other African country without having uh, these platforms whereby we can um, meet and talk and establish long lasting partnerships. So now, I think that we should have um, permanent, permanent uh, platforms whereby we meet and talk and shape um, or forge long lasting partnerships. That's all, thank you. Thank you, Bokim. I think um, also I wish to thank uh, Minji and Benson for stimulating questions, um, hearing from, from the entrepreneurs. But I also wish to um, uh, pass the floor to Jamie and uh, uh, our colleagues um, to speak from the, uh, the other perspectives other than youth. So over to you, Jamie. Thank you uh, very much, Yuki. You know, um, let me be quite short, um, both in conscious of time and also so that we can leave some time for Ellen as well and because I spoke at the introduction and uh, let me I think I would say one overarching takeaway from me from this discussion is that we often hear a lot about the challenges that LLDCs face but to me here today it's very clear um, that for me it's optimism is the the sense of feeling I get you know that I think these are a lot of very powerful examples of what can be achieved and drilling down from that I'd maybe highlight three specific takeaways the first is um something I think uh, Muketsi spoke to, which is tackling some of the challenges that are facing these countries straight on. So the, the challenge there may be access to finance, something that um, one of the other speakers uh, spoke about, and through peer investing, it, it's an opportunity to overcome exactly that kind of challenge. The second um, kind of specific takeaway, uh, I think, was something that Bill Goon said, which is that um, the traditional challenges that LLDCs face is in the difficulties of exporting because you have to transit through a neighboring country to get to ports to excel your goods to elsewhere in the world but as many of you have spoken to there's great opportunities in digital solutions to kind of overcome those physical barriers with digital business models and and the last thing i wanted to note was something very interesting that bokim said which was that these countries need to export more they need to earn foreign exchange um, to be able to finance their needs and I wonder if there are opportunities to marry two of those ideas to um, to develop digital exports where services can be exported to elsewhere in the world to overcome the physical challenges through transiting through borders that LLDCs face. So I'm, uh, you know, I maybe given the time constraints, I won't pose that question, but rather leave it as something for us to think on and come back to it another point and then pass over to Ellen. Uh, so you have a bit of time to to yourself to speak as well. Thank you very much, everyone. Really enjoyed the session. Thank you very much, Jamie, and thank you everyone for having me here today. Thank you to Bokim, Tadala, Joseph, Bilgoon, and Muketsi for your fantastic interventions and sharing a bit about your experience as as young entrepreneurs. I think this conversation has really encapsulated exactly the opportunities and challenges with digital technologies and young people engaging in the digital space. I'd like to start, I have a lot of ideas, but I'd like to start, I think, first with that kind of recognizing who's not here on, on a Teams call. Um, you know, over one third of the world's population remains unconnected to the internet. That's 2.6 billion people, roughly. And as we as we heard today, the opportunities in the digital space are plentiful. Um, so that kind of infrastructure development and connectivity is is very essential, and it's part of ITU's core mission to 
bring that connectivity and infrastructure because that step helps investments uh, for investments in high speed internet, which in turn bring new economic op opportunities, attract foreign investment, and enable local businesses to compete globally, as as we kind of heard today. Um, and then kind of moving and reflecting on on what I heard, I was so excited to hear about Tadala, your project and and uh, and Joseph in the ways you're looking at uh, redefining the agriculture sector, which is of of crucial importance to several LLDCs um, and really using digital technology to to transform and kind of make it an e-agriculture business. So I think that's a, a really key kind of piece to consider and consider how incorporating those digital technologies can amplify uh, further that work. Another thing I'd like to highlight uh, was the partnerships and innovation that I, I heard in the discussion today. I think that is incredible. And uh, Muketsi, you spoke about developing your um, business as kind of an accident, but I see it as as pure innovation and the ways that you're approaching these problems in very creative and, and innovative uh, solutions is really incredible. And I think that innovation centers are crucial and um, ITU has innovation centers that that aim to kind of address this and look at local startup ecosystems and how to support people like yourselves who are young and facing these challenges head on and being very creative in the ways that you're doing it. Um, so that's that's one thing as well that I'd like to highlight. And the last I'd like to kind of, um, just given the time uh, to kind of speak on is the, the digital inclusion element. Um, I mean, given our, like the young people we heard from today, I think it's clear that youth are really um, engaging in the digital space and are experts in engaging in digital spaces. And so the partnerships that are formed, we have to think about um, youth as digital natives and as really important stakeholders to engage as we think about developing any kind of policies or further supporting entrepreneur, entrepreneurial activities. Um, and that universal access at the core of ICT design is so important so we can engage more young people in this digital ecosystem and foster uh, a more equitable and inclusive digital society moving forward. So thank you very much. I know we're running short on time, so I won't ask a question. I'll pass it back uh, to our, our moderator. Thanks so much. Thank you, Ellen. Very well articulated and very much on, on the spot, I guess. Um, it's, it's very exciting to hear from you. I would uh, like to, given that we have uh, not too much time left, uh, pass the floor to, to Shin um, and then for the for the closing part uh, to have, say a few more words on, on your insights. Shin, over to you. Uh, thank you, Yuki. Uh, and as we are approaching the finish line of our study event today, I just want to express um, my sincere gratitude to all the speakers and discussants for providing us with uh, extremely insightful and thought-provoking discussions today. And just want to um, flag that we are now collecting feedback to our draft youth declaration, which will be further populated as the outcome document of uh, the LRDC3 youth track. Uh, you may visit our dedicated uh, web page for more information. I will put the link into the chat box and also please follow us uh, on our social media account uh, on, on X, LinkedIn, YouTube, uh, stay tuned. We will continue to work uh, devotedly for the welfare of people in LDCs, LDCs and Cs. Uh, we look forward to your participation to our following events. Thank you. Over to you, Yuki. Thank you very much, Shin. And uh, yes, we have a lot to bring in from this discussion for the youth declaration, further developments for the LLDC3 in the youth track, but also private sector track and beyond. And I guess we gained a lot of um, good insights from you to, to be inspired. I think Jamie mentioned the word optimism, and I think I can totally hear that as well, the energy coming from the youth entrepreneurs. I think this is something we definitely wish to take forward to Kigali.
And also, I think a great highlight we got was partnership, the importance of partnership, importance of innovation hubs, the importance to include this young generation into our discussions. And I think this is exactly what we are trying to do at the LLDC3, and we will put our efforts into it. And we have Benson and Minji from the Youth Advisory Group also with us, who are the advocates who will be present in the conference to represent the voices, not only from youth entrepreneurs, but the youth in general. And I think, Ellen, you really articulated well to say how many people we have from the from the youth side, but also how many we are, we are having to not being connected yet. Connectivity issue is a very major part of LLDCs. And I think this is something we should further continue discussing. Uh, digital solutions, obviously, are the solutions. All of you entrepreneurs, I'm looking at uh, Joseph, Birgun, Tadala, Mokitsi, Bokim, who have joined today, but we have way more entrepreneurs who have not raised their voices. And I guess this is something for us as a homework to take forward for LLDC3 to further discuss and to, to further develop. So we have uh, also the opportunity to, to bring these innovations to the light and make the best use of it. So with this, I really wish to thank you. It was a very, very exciting session. I know this is part of the ECOSOC Youth Forum. So I guess a lot of you will be participating hopefully further in this week. So it is a very youth focused week uh, at the United Nations. The, the New York headquarter is, is very much uh, filled with different youth uh, backgrounds and discussions. So very much hoping to continue these discussions in other fora and of course, including in the LLDC3 conference to be happening in Kigali. Thank you very much for joining us and thank you for your insights and really thank you again to the entrepreneur sharing your experiences. Thank you. Hopefully see you soon. Goodbye. Thank you so much to everyone. Oh, thank, thank you so you. much. Bye bye. Goodbye. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.